allow us to introduce ourselves. Hello, uh, I'm Simon, the, the smart one. He's Alvin, the awesomest one. And I'm Theodore. <laughs> Well, my dad, first of all, had an amazing sense of humor, number one. Number two, he started as a songwriter. First song he ever wrote, Come On To My House, for Rosemary Clooney. Before that, he had about 60 acres in Fresno, raising grapes. The business was terrible, and my, my mom and dad said, the music business can't be any tougher than grapes and raisins. Let's at least follow our dream. So my dad took the family, moved to L.A. 1950 with the one song he had written, Come On To My House. Huge hit, and he's thinking, this is the life. Grapes and raisins are way tougher than the music business. Well, of course, after that, few dry years. So it's now 1958, my dad's got $200 left in the bank and is crazy enough to take the $200 and buys the state-of-the-art tape recorder that allows him to change speeds. Now I'll rehearse the boys of the tape. This is the tape recorder, and, and what it was able to do that none of the other things could do back in those days is actually switch speeds. You could actually change the speed so that then my dad spoke like that into this handy-dandy microphone. Hey, that sounds fine. And he writes Witch Doctor. He had sped up the sound of a piano before, and he loved what that did, and he thought, I wonder what that would do to a voice. Of course, that became really the kind of the genesis of what would be the, the chipmunk sound about six months later. <laughs> Witch Doctor comes out, it's a huge hit. I love it because we get to get a swimming pool. A couple of months later, the record company comes to my dad and said, you know, we'd love another one of those novelty things, one of those fun, everyone wants to buy it kind of songs. Could you do another one of those? So my dad had played around with the chipmunk of, you know, vocal of the witch doctor and said, okay, I just want to give it more personality. What, what could they be, you know, singing reindeer, alligator, hippopotami, what? And he was driving around in Yosemite about July of 1958 thinking, reindeer, grasshoppers, what? And this little tiny chipmunk jumps out onto the road and dares my father to drive past. And so the audacity of that character just killed my dad. He fell out of the car laughing hysterically. He was not wondering grasshoppers anymore. It was now the chipmunks. And that character, that chipmunk became Alvin. You know, that in the face of whatever, Here's Alvin. Watch it, genius. We're chipmunks. Chipmunks. There were three record executives that my dad was signed to Liberty Records at the time, and Alvin or Al Bennett was the president, Simon or Cy Warrenker, that became Simon, and Theodore, Ted Keep, was the head engineer over there. So the voices came from those three record guys. And personality-wise, Simon, of course, was the studious one with glasses, and Theodore was the giggler, overweight kid who loved to eat. So he never really filled those relationships and those personalities out like he did with Alvin. It was definitely the David Seville and Alvin show. Alvin! You call me? To hear Alvin talk back to my dad was thrilling for, for the three kids. Uh, so we loved it and we loved the interplay and, and my dad made Alvin sound so real. Not only did he play the voice of David Seville, of course, but my dad also was the voices of all three chipmunks, including Alvin. So in essence, he's yelling at himself. Alvin? Alvin? Woo! He's kicked a hamster wheel's butt. In 1958, the tradition was that you never played a Christmas song before December something or other. So my dad is late October, 
early November trying to get the Chipmunk song on the air. And nothing is happening because everyone's got tradition. Finally, my dad gets a guy to listen to it, and he loves it, and he puts it on. And of course, it was the proverbial lighting up of the switchboard, not unlike, you know, Christmas tree lights. So everyone wants to he get this song. And the fun thing about it was that it sold four and a half million records in seven weeks. It was an unheard of thing. It's the fastest selling song in the history of the music business to that date. And it didn't become eclipsed until five, six years later when the Beatles stormed in the United States. It was an overnight sensation and just, just a huge, huge thing. Speed of business, baby. That's how we do it. That's how I roll. <laughs> a couple of years later, he had the TV show, The Alvin Show, on CBS primetime back in those days. And of course, a whole cottage industry of all the various licensing. He certainly wasn't the first one to do that, but he did it in a way that was huge for the characters. There were even front page articles about what my dad was doing in terms of a, a cottage industry for Alvin and the Chipmunks. <sighs> this is not happening. I am not talking to Chipmunks. I am not talking to Chipmunks. So, how's that working for you, Dave? My dad was like the Armenian version of Zorba the Greek. You felt he was gonna live to be 8,000 years old. So when he passed away, that was like an episode of the Twilight Zone for me. This cannot be happening. For me, a way of still having my dad around was to resurrect Alvin and the Chipmunks. I thought, well, this, this won't be hard. Everyone's loved them growing up. They're great characters. I'll bring them back again, and it wouldn't take but a year or so. So, like Fuller Brush people, we had brochures made, we went to the toy fair, we got the door slammed in our faces. A disc jockey in Philadelphia at about 2 or 3 in the morning, this is now 1980, plays Blondie's Call Me but speeds it up so it sounds like the chipmunks and facetiously announces it to about seven people or whoever is up at three or four in the morning as the latest song from the chipmunks. Well, like in 1958, the phones of the radio station are deluged. Oh my gosh, we've been waiting for this. Where do we get this record? And of course it doesn't exist. So people uh, from back east called Janice and me, uh, listen, would you guys be interested in doing a new album? And, you know, we didn't even have the good sense to give it a pause for us. You bet we would! And we jumped and probably were way too eager. <laughs> so a couple of months later, Chipmunk Punk comes out, and as the Chipmunks sprang from zero to 60, full speed ahead back in 1958. Here it was in 1980, sold a million and a half records before you knew what happened. I loved the design of the 60s, but I thought they were very 60s. I thought they were very stylized, so I thought we should bring them and update them to the 80s. I wanted to make sure that the relationship that Ross Sr. created with Alvin was as real with us as it was with him. And I also wanted to make more out of Theodore and Simon, because in Saturday morning you can do more. It was such a great opportunity to be able to create stories that young, malleable minds were watching and that perhaps you could impart good messages that could maybe get through to kids watching the show. That was important to us. Alvin, I owe you an apology. That was a wonderful thing you did for Tommy. We were on Saturday morning from 83 to 91. And what kept us going is that we would get fan mail from kids. And when we first started, we were getting fan mail for Alvin and Theodore. And I, like a guilty mother, said to Ross, we're not getting any fan mail for Simon. And we have to write some shows for Simon because no one's paying him any attention. 
<laughs> so we started writing shows for Simon, and we wrote a, a show about Simon, and it was about the perfect child, where Dave has to give his attention to the baby, he has to give his attention to the troublemaker, Alvin, but he doesn't have to give his attention to Simon because Simon's okay. He can rely on Simon. Simon's gonna do the right thing. So we got tons of fan mail for Simon after this from kids who related to Simon. And when I realized that we were having that kind of impact and that kind of voice and we were giving kids characters they could relate to, that's what kept us going. Keeping them alive, keeping them current and viable is, uh, is a full-time job. Idea! Ding, 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 ding! Who has cab fare? Cab fare? We don't even have pockets. We didn't want to make a movie that was just for four-year-olds or for five-year-olds. We, we wanted that group who'd grown up with them in the 80s and 90s who were now in their 20s to have something that was smart enough, sassy enough, and fun enough for them not only to recognize the characters from their childhood, but to still be able to enjoy them. That ought to keep them awake. Janice and I also wanted to put, you know, little sprinkles of my dad in the film. So when you come to the David Seville house in the movie, you'll see his address above the door is 1958, when my dad created the chipmunks. When Jason Lee, who plays David Seville in the movie, is teaching the chipmunks the chipmunk song, he's playing that on my dad's piano that my dad did the song on. It's so important to us that this film is something that Ross Senior would be proud of. I need something new. I need something fresh. That, that, I need that is the next new. big thing. Hopefully where the chipmunks are going to be 10 years or 800 years from now is still doing something new because the personalities, who they are, and the relationships are timeless, but presenting them in a fresh new way is, is what's exciting for us to do. Dave, they're chipmunks who talk. People will come. Mm -hmm.